Hey guys, it's Ewan with the Airzoo. Last month, the Airzoo family lost an incredible member of our restoration team when our volunteer and friend, Richard Klass, passed away. Dick was an incredibly skilled volunteer. He was team leader of our F-117 Nighthawk restoration project, a project which incredibly started and finished in the span of a year, a deadline Dick himself set for the team. He was kind and took the time to explain each process of the restoration. He demanded perfection and was willing to explore all options to reach it, no matter how out the box those options may be. Do you want to know something else incredible about Dick Class? On his first day as a restoration volunteer, he asked if the tail number of our F-104 Starfighter was accurate. When he was told it was, his eyes began to well up because this very aircraft, this very Starfighter, was the exact Starfighter he was crew chief of during the Vietnam War. What are the chances? Earlier this summer, I sat down with Dick to discuss the F-117 Nighthawk restoration project. I hope you enjoy the interview. Cool, so if, firstly, if you just wanna introduce yourself and your uh, relationship towards the uh, Nighthawk restoration, what was your role in that restoration? Well, first of all, my name is Dick Klass. Uh, been a volunteer for 12 years, and this is my first supervisory position with the F-117. So describe the, the day when you kind of got told that, hey, we're going to get a F-117 Nighthawk, we're going to get it into the air zoo, and we're going to restore it. Um, tell me a little bit about when you found out about the project. It was approximately two or three months before the actual delivery. And Greg came to me and he says, I want you to be the supervisor of that project. And it's probably one of the better days of my life to be in charge of that project. I mean, it, F-117, you know, even better than that SR-71 because it's a newer, more advanced plane. And I'm a jet person, not an old propeller airplane person. I appreciate the old propeller, but I love jets. And uh, obviously that delivery day was a very big day. Can you describe um, that day and the state that the airplane came into and uh, the air zoo at? It was um, December 11th, I remember it very good. Uh, saw the truck pull up, there were two of them, one contained the wings and one contained the, f the fuselage. And there it was, in all its glory, stripped of all of its paint, obviously no wings on, no tail tips on. Uh, and all of a sudden I realized what I'm getting myself into. <laughs> there was an awful lot of sheet metal missing. There were various panels on the top that were removed, and we come to find out they were removed because they were secret. They had antennas attached to them, so rather than take the mechanism, they just took the whole panel. Uh, we had to replace a, a lot of those panels. There were uh, a zillion screws. They had them in bottles, somewhat separated from one from another, etc. Uh, there was an awful lot of sheet metal removed for the purpose of removing the wings, the tails, etc., the Bombay area. Uh, and I'll never forget when they opened up, Troy was out on a microphone with a camera and he was talking and they opened the Bombay doors up and all the sandblasting material just come down on the ground and the wind was blowing, it got all over Troy and everything. <laughs> but it was, uh, a real experience when you see it, you say, what did I get myself into? And uh, so talk a little bit about, obviously, so they removed a lot of the aircraft. Um, they removed a lot of the aircraft, you know, the, the, the paint, the leaning and trailing edges, right. a lot of the panels and stuff like that. Yes. What, were you given any resources, any plans, any stuff to help you recreate those items, or was it just strict, just knowledge from, from the guys on the floor? When Greg asked me to be the supervisor, he gave me what is known as the Museum's Guide, written by the Air Force. 
So we knew what we were getting. I mean, you, you, there were pictures in it showing it stripped of the paint, etc., uh, and of the leading edges and the trading edges. And we did a lot of thought during those months, a couple months, how are we going to fabricate the leading and trading edges? You know, you take two pieces of sheet metal, one coming from the bottom of the wing and one coming from the top of the wing. On the museum guide, we could see the holes where we could attach the aluminum to the airplane. But how do you attach the two edges of the piece of aluminum together? Welding was just about out of question. Uh, we thought of making a uh, extrusion, have a die made and have an extrusion made. But then we started looking at all the different angles that are on the plane, and we'd have to have a half a dozen to ten different dies, and that would be very, very expensive. And one of my goals, Troy asked me how fast can we do it, and I said one year from date of delivery, and I says I will do everything to keep the cost down. And we were very, very successful. Uh, we overshot our date of completion by five days. It's not bad. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was a lot of creativity involved with the restoration, I feel. I, I remember hearing the term piano hinges a lot. Yes. Tell me a little bit about Almost the piano miles. hinges. Uh, we used uh, aircraft grade aluminum piano hinges. They were eight feet long. They had to be special ordered, and the reason we wanted eight feet was each section of the aluminum leading edge or trailing edge on the actual wing itself was eight feet long. And once we decided on, uh, and that was Dave Ruiz who made the, the comment and the idea, let's use a piano hinge because it will adapt itself to all the different angles. You know, that was a big load off of my mind. Uh, then attaching these hinges, uh, every eight feet there are 96 rivets. So this now, how do you get into a production mode of 96 rivets every eight feet around that, and that airplane's 270 some feet around? So Steve uh, Romano came up with an idea of building a production table where we could drill the holes one at a time but slide the hinge, slide the, the leading edge, get it underneath the drill lined up and drill another hole and then go over to the other, there's four sides to this table, go to side number two and that was a um, deburring and countersinking station so again, it was a matter of just sliding it underneath and pulling the handle down and deburring. Then go over to the third side, and that was the actual compression riveting, where we installed the rivets and compressed them down. And again, that was a matter of just sliding down. And that saved us a tremendous amount of time. Was, was the leading edges, would you say that was the biggest challenge uh, to yes. restore? Yes. Uh, down the sides, once we got going, and you know, guys start, you know, instead of doing this, let's do it this way, and that's a good idea, and we adopted that idea. Going down the sides, 72 feet down each side, which is an absolute straight line. Every time the guys would put up eight feet, I would go up with a laser and put it all the way at the back and shine a line to the, the end of theirs. And that's how we kept our straight. And one of the secrets was we took the hinge pin from the hinge of the last leading edge that we put on and we recessed that hinge pin four inches back and the new piece had an extended hinge pin. So that's how we lined up and kept it straight. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the iconic things about the Nighthawk is obviously its color. Um, and traditionally, you know, the aircraft didn't use traditional paint. It was um, an REM substance, which has been described as, you know, like almost like butter occasionally. How, yes. how, what was the process of, of painting the, our Nighthawk? What are we going to paint it like? or What have we painted it as? I mean, like, we weren't going to recreate the REM, were we? No, no. It, 
that was as thick as molasses. And it, the, the 117 was a maintenance person's nightmare. To get at a panel, he had to scrape all of that gooey stuff all the way around where the screw holes were. Pick the screw holes clean so that he can put a tool in it. Uh, no, we used a good grade of uh, Air Force approved uh, Sherwin Williams metal outdoor paint. Black was the standard color. Uh, we did an awful lot of research. Everybody was doing research on it within our team. And we found one that was painted gray. Uh, and that was uh, less visible during the twilight hours. But black then stood out. But this plane only flew at night. I mean, when sun set and they would roll it out of the hangar, they wouldn't even leave one out when you start reading all of the, the material that we found on it. Uh, there was no reason to put that gooey paint on because it wasn't going to be an active airplane. We wanted to reproduce what it looked like. Was it, was it sometimes difficult to find out specific, obviously when you're trying, when the Air Zoo restores aircraft, you know, we try and do everything as properly as possible, as accurately as possible. But when we're dealing with a jet that a lot of it's still classified, was it difficult to research certain specific aspects of the aircraft? We did get a set of blueprints from the Skunk Works. These airplanes were made in groups of five, six, seven at a time over a period of about eight years. There was only 63 of them. So there was a lot of span sometimes between build number three and build number four. Uh, and there were a lot of advancements that were made, the mistakes that they made here. Um, airplane number six and seven, eight, and nine got corrected. Uh, so the blueprints that we got from the Skunk Works, uh, there were no dates, they were all erased, so you didn't know what date it was or what airplane you were working with. What we found out with these airplanes is that identical panels, if you had uh, two panels that looked the same, everything, identical panels were not. You couldn't put one panel that came off of the left side and the other one that looked identical to the right side. They weren't. They physically, they were a little bit different. The screw holes were all different. So every panel was handmade. So the drawings gave us an idea where the panel went, but it did not tell us that. On the leading and trailing edges, uh, there were no dimensions. We tried to extrapolate the dimensions by looking at another dimension that was given and then apply some math to it to figure out what the dimension was. And one of the guys came up with an idea and said, if we put a piece of steel on this mounting port on the top of the wing and let it hang out about 15 inches and put another one on the bottom mounting port, these two are going to intersect at some point out there. And that was our standard for figuring out how long the piece of sheet metal should be sticking out from the airplane. And obviously the, the restoration didn't stop once you guys finished the aircraft. You, you guys are manufacturing some, some bombs as well. If you want to talk a little bit about that project too. Well, it was my goal to make this display the best display of aircraft. In the other building, we do have some airplanes with bombs underneath. And I thought it looked very attractive because not only did it show the airplane, but it showed the weapons that were used by the airplane. Uh, so I started thinking, let's build a bomb. And we built one. We bought enough material to build two. It was very, actually very cheap. Uh, probably not more than about three or four hundred dollars in the whole bomb. Uh, I mean, it's a tube that you put in the ground and pour some in. And we had some leftover aluminum and we wrapped it and glued that on. The, once we got the first bomb made and we mounted it up into the airplane, it was nice. But to see it, you had to walk under the airplane and now you start bumping your head on some stuff, etc. So I said, well, that's not too good because we're going to have someone that's going to get hurt. We put that box with the mirrors that reflect up so you can stand out from the airplane 
and that's when we decided we're going to build a second bomb and put it outside the airplane so that people can see it. And that's been a, let's say after all the work that we've done on the 117, the bomb has been sort of a play item. I mean, the, the, we retain the same crew and they're down there working on that. And it's a fun project. And finally, how, how does it feel, you know, walking into this building and seeing that beautiful aircraft um, looking like it just rolled off the runway, you know, it looked like it landed here. How does it feel seeing that every day, knowing that it was you and your crew that really turned this tattered, picked apart, silver plane missing its edges into this kind of really scary looking um, night fighter, like stealth fighter? What, what, how do you feel when you see it every time? Well, it, it, it's, it's sad that it's, the project has ended, but I'm happy that well, we didn't go over by more than five days. Uh, but I still look at it every day that I come in. It's. And I think it's. I think it's really cool as well. Just personally, that you have your 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 original plane, your Starfighter, yes. beside your brand new plane, yes. your uh, your Nighthawk. I, I don't think a lot of people uh, know about that. But for me, I think it's so cool that you 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 have a personal kind of ownership over these two these two aircraft side by side, and these two fantastic aircraft as well. Right, you know, the 104, I mean, when I started here 12 years ago, I walked into the building in the other location and saw the tail number on it, and I said, that really looks familiar. And when I got home that night, I started rummaging through my pictures, etc. and lo and behold, it was the one. Now, here's what's funny about both of these. That's an F-104C, and they only made 76 of those. And I'm part of one of 76. They only made 73 or whatever it is, or 68 of the 117. And I'm part of that. that that's just something special. And then what do you what do you hope, or what, ideally, what would you what would you love for your next project to be? A10. I hear that a lot in this building. <laughs> Well, an A-10 would be great. We had them in Battle Creek. They landed a couple of them here every so often. You could see them flying over. Uh, again, I'm a jet man. We need another propeller airplane like we need a home ahead as far as I'm concerned. We need... Well, the kids today have no appreciation. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you take a 21-year-old... Uh, World War II is just so far back, it's in an old history book on a shelf somewhere. But the Vietnam War, the Cold War, uh, where jets were used, that to me is what the, the people of today, the younger generation, when I say younger, I mean anyone under 40 years old. <laughs> well, fantastic. That's all I have to, to pester you about. I appreciate that. Okay.